Right, looks like everyone's here. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Today we're going to be talking about the ethics of AI usage. And this is part two. If you didn't see our previous webinar, you can go back and see that. We have it listed on our website and we'll be giving a link to a page where that is available for you. So let me introduce my co-presenters. Today we have Ellen Samuels of Just Tech here. And slides are not moving. Give me a second while I try to, there we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> while we get going. So thank you for joining us. Ellen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Thank you so much, Shelly. Thanks for um, having me to talk about this very exciting and uh, topical information. So I am Ellen Samuel. I am the Director of Consulting at Just Tech. We provide um, legal technology consulting services and managed services, so um, technology assistance to mostly legal aids and nonprofits, um, and I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Okay. We're having trouble with slides today, apparently. So <laughs> that's okay. this is a slide that's going to be what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the legal ethics in AI. We're going to talk a little bit about privacy and data security. We're going to talk some about the deep fakes that are out there. Um, and then we're going to discuss a little bit about the state ethics opinions that have been released and some court guidance and rules and how you can keep track of those. We're going to talk a little bit about the sanctions that have happened because of AI usage. And then we're going to give you a model policy, or actually it's model guidelines for AI usage within the legal aid organization. So I wanted to start today with this quote um, that Ben Gladstein of, the, um, of Microsoft um, said earlier this week. And it's just to be a mediocre lawyer in general you have to understand AI. If you want to be a great AI lawyer, I think you should be playing around with the technology. You should be curious and you should be experimenting. It's quite a statement. So Ellen, I'd like to get your reaction to this, but my, my opinion is that he's right. Um, we have to know the technology. I don't think it requires us to use the technology, but we do need to understand the technology and why you know, attorneys have been sanctioned. So I'd like to get your opinion since you're educating the future lawyers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I would even take out the second AI in the statement and just say, if you want to be a great lawyer at this point, you need to be playing <laughs> around with this technology. I, I think he is right. And um, to, to your point about understanding the technology, I, I think maybe some people are kind of scared of it because it's such a, a huge concept, but you don't have to really understand the inner workings at all in order to use the technology. But as we're going to talk about today, you do need to understand, you know, the risks and the benefits to using the technology and how it might affect your clients, affect your attorney's practice, and, you know, the really the ethics behind using the technology. But absolutely, the, and the, the barrier to entry here, the cost is so low that why not, right? $20 a month, we should all be playing with it and seeing what it can do. Well, and, and we'll be giving some resources where you don't even have to pay the $20 a month. You can use the publicly available resources such as Microsoft Copilot. Right. But I do want to disagree with you a little bit. I think we do have to at least understand what's going on when we put a request in one of these search engines, I think you need to understand that it is not research like we think of research that you know we were trained to do in law school. We're using Westlaw or Lexis and one of those tools. It is um, using algorithms to predict answers. So if you use it in the same way that you would use Westlaw or Lexis, I think you're bound to get yourself into trouble um, quicker than if you understand what the system is actually doing. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely agree. And even as a search engine, right? Because at least with a search engine, you can see how results have been ranked and how popular they are and, and hopefully a little bit how um, reliable they are. And that's not guaranteed here. You could get something that's completely bonkers. Um, and you need to still know enough to know that it's bonkers, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. That's great and I do want to encourage the audience, if you have questions while we're going through the presentation, go ahead and throw them in the chat. We may not address them immediately, but because you know we know that we'll be talking about that in a future slide, but we can always go back at the end if we have not hit those questions. So please, if you're like me, I'll forget about it if you know if I try to remember. So go ahead and throw them in the chat, and that way we, you won't forget about them, and you'll get the question answered. Yeah, so just um, Ellen's going to do a quick recap here of some things that we need to think about as far as legal ethics. So we did touch on this briefly in our last session, but it is so important that we thought it was it bears repeating. Uh, when you are using really any technology, so you know this AI has been kind of a a buzz, right? But the technology, the the fact that this is technology, does not change the ethical rules that are behind this, right? As as attorneys, as legal uh, professionals, we still have to understand the rules of professional conduct in our state, and they apply regardless of the technology. So if you were around when email became popular, that was the big exciting thing. Um, and then cloud computing and now AI, the rules don't change based on the technology, but the things that you need to do to, in order to make sure that you're following the rules are gonna be the same because they're they're broad enough, right? So the, you know, one of the most important rules is in most states, the very first rule is going to be the rule to be that attorneys must practice competently. Um, here, and I am referring to the ABA rules of professional conduct, but for the most part, they have been adopted by every state. Some differences in numbers and some little tweaks in language, but generally they say the same thing. Back you know, 10, 15 years ago, the drafters of the rules, which the first rule says that attorneys, again, have to practice competently. They have to be competent in the area that they practice. Uh, they've added a comment or added language to comment eight that specifically called out technology and says that attorneys have to be aware of the risks and benefits and uses of technology when they're practice practicing, right? Uh, so really important. I haven't seen any disciplinary rules on this yet, but the ways that actually attorneys are using AI incompetently, it, they very well may be coming down down uh, down the, the line. The next rule that we, is really important, especially when it comes to AI, is confidentiality. So we, as legal professionals, all are required to keep our clients' information confidential, unless there's some, you know, some certain exceptions there. But we want to make sure that if we are putting confidential information about a client into one of these systems, how are we assured that it's going to remain confidential? So when you're using some of the free versions of these tools like ChatGPT, the data that you're putting into the system may very well be used to train the system and also could escape the system. It could be used um, or spit out through some, you know, from somebody else using the system. So you want to ensure that whatever you are using, if you're going to put confidential information into that system, that it's going to be protected. There's a number of legal specific tools that you can be more assured that that's going to remain within the system. And also a, the paid version of many of these tools. If you read the terms and conditions and the privacy statements, many of them say that the information will be used for training, will remain protected. But in order to make sure that you are following this rule, you really need to make sure, excuse me, or your organization needs to make sure that the tools that you are using are going to keep your client's information confidential. Number 3.3 .3 for most places is that a lawyer shall not knowingly make a false statement of fact or law. Um, you know, and Shelley's, and we're going to talk a little bit more about attorneys who have been sanctioned recently uh, or gotten in trouble for using AI in a way where they were not using a proper statement of law. Um, this knowingly thing is interestingly interesting, right? Like how, how much research, how much due diligence do you need to know to do to make sure that you are not knowingly providing a false statement of fact or law? But um, this actually is, is interesting when it comes to deep fakes, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, what if we have fake evidence, right? How far do we need to go to make sure that the evidence that we're relying on in court is actually the truth? And um, there's lots of videos now that are not very clear whether it's reality or not. And, you know, 
people are making voices say things that they didn't actually say. So um, that's one to keep in mind as well. Rule 5.3 is supervision of non-lawyer assistants or assistants. So it's uh, in some states it's um, TS and some so referring to people in some states it's uh, CE. Um, so this rule says that attorneys, uh, supervisory attorneys generally have to supervise people who are working for them um, and make sure that they are following the rules of professional conduct as well. It's an open question right now for many states, can reliance on AI tools AI tools establish a violation of this rule in particular? Is this meant only for people assistance or is it meant for any tool that you are using? Do you need to supervise these tools to make sure that they are providing uh, appropriate answers? So that's kind of an open question. And then uh, another thing to think about is rule 8.4, which is a prohibition against engaging in discriminatory, uh, discriminatory conduct. So the ABA has actually suggested that lawyers might violate this rule by using biased AI platforms. And maybe not a surprise, almost all AI platforms are biased in some way because of the way they've been trained. So you at least need to be aware of the fact that the tools are being biased and think about how that might affect your the, the clients that you're serving. There's a variety of federal rules of civil procedure that I'm not going to get into specifics about, but um, just you know, being aware that and and state rules of um, of civil procedure and criminal procedure that you have to make sure that if you're presenting a pleading, a motion, uh, that it has been vetted, that you are providing accurate information to the court. We're going to talk about the state bar um, opinions in a little bit. Um, and you just want to make sure also that you are balancing your ethical responsibilities with the efficiency that these tools provide. Shelly, was there anything more you wanted to talk about um, efficiency and ethical responsibilities or should we talk about that in a little bit? I, I think we'll, as we go through the other slides, we'll be hitting on a lot of those things. And many of the points that Ellen hit on have been, <laughs> we're going to be talking about some of the cases where attorneys did not meet those um, those levels of professional conduct and what has happened to them because of it. So we'll see those in the coming slides. So again, um, privacy and data security is a huge issue for this. Um, and as Ellen mentioned previously, we must ensure that any client information is protected. And this is important because even Microsoft Word now has the option to have AI power, right? So you have to make sure that um, even the everyday tools, Microsoft Word, um, you know, uh, Google Ma Gmail, um, things like that that you're using that does use AI now are are they protecting your information? And that's something, you know, if you're not able to determine that yourself, you can go to your IT department. Um, Ellis and Tap also is developing resources to help in those matters, but it's something that you want to make sure. And one thing you can do to um, prevent the release of, of information accidentally is use client in place of the client's actual name or, um, put in, you know, generic information versus your client specific um, city or you know, use, use a replacement when you're um, prompting generative AI for an answer. Um, anything here that you want to um, bring up, Ellen? Just making sure that you are still aware of data security best practices, right? It, it doesn't change with AI. Um, making sure that the tools that you're using, um, if, if there's a multi-factor authentication or single sign-on option there, that we are protecting the information that we're putting in these systems and we're protecting them from escaping our uh, technology infrastructure and um, protecting our clients' information. You also just want to make sure that if if your firm has AI guidelines, which we're going to talk a little bit about later, that um, you're reviewing them, and if you're in an op, you know a position to uh, promulgate those to staff and making sure that staff understand them and that you have um, 
training on those issues and, and making sure that there's a continuing open dialogue with staff on these issues because it's going to change very rapidly. The Again, the underlying ethics of the situation stay the same. We have to protect our clients' information. We need to make sure we're practicing competently. We need to make sure that we are protecting our systems, but the particulars of the technology may change quickly. About recording client conversations, Shelly, did, did you, or did, was there something more you wanted to add there? Well, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I think we have seen, um, there was a huge wave of everyone was using these um, AI, uh, generative AI, um, like Firefly AI, when you go into a Zoom call, things like that. And for a while, I was seeing it like everywhere. And I, I'm seeing them drop off, off now. And I'm wondering if it's because people are realizing that you know, there are state guidelines on recording, you know, right. um, you know and it, it, it's important to understand the technology. And when you use these recording AIs, that information is going outside of your organization, being analyzed, and then the transcription is being sent back. So um, if your state has a um, law or rule about um, recording a conversation without um, giving notice to the other party, um, it's something to think about if you're using these and also making sure that the, the system that you are using is protecting that information, as Ellen mentioned earlier, making sure that it is staying in that closed system versus going into training data. I, and I was actually, Shelly and I were talking a few days ago, I'm on a listserv where there was an attorney who called into a client meeting on the phone and later found out that the client had been recording using an AI um, transcription service. And she found out because a summary of the meeting was sent to her with, you know, next steps and stuff like that. And she, the attorney was justifiably livid because she didn't know she was being recorded. And then she had concerns about whether the information discussed remained privileged, right? We have, we have these privileges that can be broken by interception or by, you know, a third party, unrelated third party being there. And she didn't know where things were being stored. She didn't know how things were being used. And it was also, you know, the attorney client relationship is really based on trust and, and openness. And so, you know, not being aware that this was happening was really kind of a frustration of that relationship. I would say even if your state does not require you to uh, disclose that you're recording a, com a conversation, it's definitely the best practice to do that regardless. Uh, people do not like being recorded without knowing they're being recorded. And so you don't want to damage relationships in that way without uh, you know, being very clear that that is what is happening. Yeah, and I've, I've seen many attorneys, some of whom I have great respect for, um, suggesting that attorneys use these services for phone calls so that when they do get off the phone call, they do have that list of ne next steps. But I personally have not um, had my um, concerns satisfied that that doesn't break privilege. So it's something to think about um, and we'll continue to research and certainly provide updates as we have more information. So I'm sure everyone's heard of deep fake technology and what it is, is, you know, when a, oops, we've slid forward, let's go back. <laughs> Um, so deep fake technology is when a fake digitally manipulated video or audio file is produced by generative AI or deep learning of some kind, and it typically features the likeness or the voice of someone that did not actually occur. So um, I think Ellen has a great example here of Kate McKinnon. Do you want to talk about that, Ellen, before I go into more details? Yeah, if you so this is um, Kate McKinnon and um, and now why am I blanking on um, <laughs> what is her name? The president <laughs> candidate. Yes, I can't not. Um, uh, I can't anyway, uh, either. 
we were talking about this exact picture this morning. Uh, Elizabeth Warren. Um, so this was a, uh, if you can see here, so the Kate McKinnon played Elizabeth Warren on uh, SNL and did an amazing job. But just look at this picture, right? Who is actually, you know, which one of these is, is accurate? Neat. One of them is not the real portrayal of, of reality, right? Like, so one of them, I believe this is actually Kate McKinnon, but now I can't even remember. Um, but this is, you know, this is happening more and more frequently. It's particularly concerning now that we are coming into a, an election cycle. Um, there's some really interesting deep fakes going around uh, about political candidates saying things or not saying things, right? And how do we know what is true? Um, it's it, it, yeah, it's just, it's very concerning, but um, you could see like this is a fantastic example of like which which of this is the the actual person. Right? Yeah, it's going to be I you know I think we're at the point in this technology that we're just going to have to question everything, you know. And I found it interesting um, not too long ago, many um, uh, um, journalism outlets like retracted Kate Middleton's photo that she took right. because it had been edited. So I think we're going to see that, you know, as we find technology, um, as this deep fake technology is being used more and more by bad actors, we're going to see more and more of these opportunities for news to be retracted, or maybe we don't even hear something because they can't verify the source. So right. it's going to be um, really interesting. And I think that our parents um, are going to be a target of this fake news and these um, the deep fake technology because they perhaps may be more vulnerable to accepting something that they see on television, for example. Um, so it's going to be interesting how this plays out. And I think, you know, there are companies trying to create uh, methods of determining if something is fake, but there's not a foolproof way at this time. I'm going to throw right. a link to Judge Schlegel, and he is a proponent of using AI technology, and I might posit that um, his uses are a good way for deepfake technology to be used for good. And for example, you know, Judge Schlegel sat in front of the camera once and then he has used that same sitting to create court um, instructions for people who come to his court. Um, he's used it to create translations in Spanish. And you honestly cannot tell when he's not truly speaking. The technology is so good, it changes the lip movements. It helps to um, make those you know, gestures match the words that are coming out of the speaker's mouth. So I think that um, legal aid is going to be able to harness this in the future for providing information on their websites. I am kind of leaning personally to recommending a, you know, an artificial intelligent um, uh, replacement for a person instead of using someone within the organization because I think that would be very confusing for a client who comes in having watched videos online and seen someone speaking in Spanish, but then when they say something in, to them in the hall, <clears throat> that person can't understand them. I think that would be very problematic. So um, I, I just think it's an opportunity to try new things and get our messages out in new ways, utilizing technology and saving money um, because you can do it, like I said, you can have someone sit once and then use that same image for multiple purposes. You have yeah. any thoughts on that, Ellen? No, I think I think that's a great point. And I think a lot of these technologies, you know, what they really do is they increase efficiency and um, you know, and a more efficient re use of resources, which could be good and bad. So maybe that's bad for you know the the. Uh, the actors of the world who, you know, might otherwise be employed by legal aid. Maybe, I don't know if anybody's actually employing actors in their videos. You're, you're right. It's going to be some, some, some paralegal who's made to do it. <laughs> um, but, uh, she might be. 
um, but but yeah, it's it's interesting uh, for sure. And um, you know, the language the language issue is an interesting one. And and there's people on both sides. Um, I think of this debate that the the language translation services are actually pretty good but they're not as good as a person, right? But, you know, is it better to provide an imperfect service and provide service or no service of, at all? And there's people who feel very passionately um, on both ways, but, you know, ChatGPT and some of these other services, they can now, they can mimic dialects. They can, you know, you could have um, a, a, a dialect of Me Mexican Spanish versus Spain Spanish and how those are different. And it, it does a pretty, pretty darn good job. So um, it'll be interesting to to follow the developments here. But yeah, definitely. I think this technology is going to make it easier for us to communicate with our clients in kind of a broader, more professional way. I actually had that discussion about language translation um, last week at a conference. And it was really interesting and how guidelines that are meant to protect are now, you know, like Department of Justice guidelines on translations are actually inhibiting um, the use of new tools such as this. Um, so it's gonna be really interesting. Yeah, definitely. So as many of you know, I'm sure that Florida, California, and New York have all issued guidance on the use of AI. And um, do you want to start out the discussion, Ellen, or would you like yeah. to? Yeah, okay. for sure. I'm happy to. Um, so there, there are links in the, the presentation to these, um, these opinion, state opinions, but um, definitely easy to Google and find them. Uh, there, it's, it's kind of interesting how to see the differences and kind of review these. These are three of the biggest states of, you know, lawyer population. So it makes sense that they have kind of started the ball rolling, but we do anticipate that these are going to come out for, for every state. Uh, but they, they have some similarities for all of the opinions and I anticipate they're going to be, you know, similarities among um, all of what them when they come out, but there's some differences as well, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, first of all, the opinions focus, on confidentiality and security. So as we talked about in the the ethics, you know, on the ethics slide, it's really important when using these tools to understand how you're using them and how that's going to affect protecting your client's confidential information. So the all of the opinions say that lawyers and, and legal professionals who are using these tools need to make sure that the tools themselves have adequate security measures to prevent unauthorized access by people who shouldn't be seeing the information or disclosure of that client information. Again, for some of the free tools, if you put it in, you don't necessarily know where it might pop out, um, you know, in somebody else's uh information when they're using these tools. So attorneys, everyone needs to make sure that they are cautious about inputting confidential information into these systems. And they may, as Shelly mentioned, you may need to anonymize the data or avoid entering identifiable details, right? So unless you're absolutely sure that your inform the information is going to be protected, it is you know, a good idea to take that information out of there. And I think attorneys are used to kind of doing this already, right? We were taught to speak in hypotheticals if we need to share information about a client situation, but not actually disclose, um, you know, who, who it is or what the specifics of the representation. So, um, you know, that the tools can help and provide guidance there with that less specific information. The second thing that is similar among the opinions is that there you need to use these tools competently and oversee them. So again, we talked about the duty of competence and that applies to AI technology as well. The attorneys need to understand what the tools are capable of and the limitations of the tools in order to use them properly and competently, um, which I think gets to the point that you were making earlier, Shelley, about understanding this is not significant, this is not good enough for research and you cannot rely on some of the stuff that these things spit out. Um, 
California in particular talks more about bias, which we will talk about um, in a minute, but that, and we're gonna talk about the sanctions and, and the things that uh, people have been relying on, but there are limitations to these tools and there are significant in your inaccuracies. So, um, you know, that's why I think that attorneys and paralegals are not gonna be out of a job anytime soon because you need to make sure that you're checking that these tools are spitting out the right stuff. Uh, there's a big headline recently about New York City um, kind of brought out its own tool in order to advise, uh, I think it was for small business owners or people in general about legalities. And I actually checked it out and I asked it to tell me a little bit more about uh, the housing choice voucher program and whether it is legal to discriminate against somebody based on that. And what it told me about was exotic animal law and you know whether or not you can have like a peacock in your apartment, right? So it, it was, it, that was so far off that I hope anyone would know that that's not correct, but like it was also spitting out some stuff that could sound right, but absolutely was not right. So it does that as well. So you need to make sure that you're checking the output of the tools and that you're using them comp competently. Uh, the I'll opinion a link to that case early or to that, to an article on that later in the oh. presentation. Yeah, great, wonderful. Um, the opinions also talk about disclosure and transparency, and this is really interesting. Um, at least California and Florida suggest that lawyers communicate with their clients about the use of these tools in representation. I don't think it's required, but if your state is suggesting this, then it's probably a good idea. Um, so they suggest saying that you disclose in, in your representation agreement how you're going to be using AI and the risks and benefits associated with its use and any implications on the client, um, client's case or legal matters. And actually, New York's um, opinion gives language, like, like suggested language to put in there into an engagement letter. Um, this is really interesting to me because uh, 10 years back, a lot of states said the same thing about cloud computing, that you needed to al alert your client to the fact that you would be storing their information in the cloud and, and the risks and benefits to that. Nowadays, I I think most people would assume that an attorney, especially after the pandemic hit, that an attorney or anyone is gonna be storing information in the cloud because that's just how we work now. So I don't know if if most states think that you still need to do that, right? But they, we're, we're at that point still in the AI um, age where the, the states think that you need to tell your clients um, that you're using these tools. I don't know if anybody actually is, but... Um, and then the, lab, the final similarity that we're seeing a lot of is, you know, no, this may not, well, it, it still affects legal aid as well, but for attorneys who are billing hourly, um, lawyers cannot bill for time that they didn't actually spend on the client's case. So if these tools are making you 25, 50, 75% more effective, you cannot bill for that entire time that you used to spend um, on these tasks now that you're doing them more quickly. Um, I think this is gonna be really interesting to see how the for-profit law world changes here, right? Because the billable hour has been everything. And if we are doing things that much more efficiently and, um, and the attorneys are being honest about it, is that gonna make us change to a different billing model? Maybe we're gonna go to more for, flat fee. I don't know, Shelly, what do you think? I love that Florida did address that in their guidance and they did suggest that flat fees might become more attractive right. <laughs> for that reason. <laughs> so. Right, absolutely. There's already been a movement towards flat fee billing you know, in the, in the, um, the profit law world. So um, that'll be interesting. But you know, for all of us in legal aid, you also need to be aware you can't be billing grants, right? Same thing. You can't be putting in time that you're not actually spending on um, on working on a client matter. So, uh, and also, is it fair? Is it fair to clients to not use these tools? You know, if, if you are billing hourly, um, if it's going to make you that much more efficient, you are really um, not, you know, it's kind of like not using word processing software or uh, not using case management system. Does it, at what point does it become unfair to the client to not use this software that's going to make you that more 
much more efficient. Anything else you wanted so to add? Yeah. Well, I was just going to point out that you, you might think, okay, well, I'm not in Florida, California, or New York. Well, Illinois, Minnesota, Texas, Kentucky are all working on AI guidance, and I would imagine the rest are going to follow. So <laughs> something to watch out for in the future for other states. Absolutely. They all have tasks so, for a task. I know at least Illinois has a task force, and um, I'm, I'm sure they're all they're all on their way. Yeah, so there were definitely some differences in these guidance. So, um, Ellen, you want to go into that? Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's interesting to see the differences, you know, maybe based on the region of the country or I don't know, or the, the types of lawyers that uh, there are in these particular states. But um, one big difference for Florida was they were really concerned about AI chatbots um, and people. And I don't know how often this happens in Florida, or maybe it's because the elder population tends to be more elderly or, or whatever. But um, the opinion says, you know, it talks about the fact that uh, about non-lawyers um, conduct, not, so non -lawyer, they say non-lawyers. So it seems like they're equating this technology with a person, like a non-lawyer. And they're saying that a non-lawyer can conduct an initial interview with a prospective client, but they have to clearly identify their non-lawyer status, limit questions to the purpose of obtaining factual information from the prospective client, and not offer any legal advice. And so they're equating this to these AI chatbots and saying that um, if a if a, an attorney or a firm is using an AI chatbot for client intake, they need to be aware of this, these rules and these guidelines. And um, I think the suggestion here is that a, a, a client, a potential client may think that the, a chatbot is a person, right? Because they speak so fluently and it, it is really hard to tell sometimes. So, um, they say that while generative AI may make these interactions seem more personable, it presents additional risks, including that a prospective client relationship or even a lawyer client relationship has been created without the lawyer's knowledge, right? How interesting is that? So the lawyer does not even need to be involved at all to create an attorney client relationship. That's a little scary <laughs> for, for the lawyers in the room, right? Um, so yeah, something to think about. The other, the other states did not go that far, and there were not such significant focuses on on chatbots in their opinions. Um, I, I, I found Florida's um, description of overly friendly chatbots. <laughs> overly friendly. <laughs> you need you need them to be very stern and just <laughs> stick to the point, <laughs> just like an actual lawyer. Um, so Florida was actually again uh, still concerned about advertising uh, and chatbots. And so they uh, specifically used, uh, addressed the use of AI lawyer advertising. And it says that all AI chatbots used for client communication or advertising must include disclaimers to inform users that they are interacting with an AI program and not a human lawyer or law firm employee. I think based on what they said about it, oversight and accidentally creating a lawyer-client relationship, I think that's an excellent idea, right? And that you pretty much do need to do that. And I think it's best practice for anyone using an HI chatbot in their practice to, just like with the recording, right? To say that this is what this is. You are not talking to a person. Um, but you know, you most business, many businesses are not doing this, right? So like if you chat with Amazon, um, about a, a missing order, you're probably not talking to a person, but who knows, like they're not clear about that, right? Um, so I think it is best practice, but Florida was just very, very clear that this is a dic disclaimer that you have to put when you're using one of those chatbots. For bias in particular, or was there more, Shelly, or? No, no. 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 Um, so California was very uh, interested in talking about bias. And, um, you know, this is something we everybody who uses AI tools and the internet in general needs to be aware of, uh, that all of these tools have been trained on large 
massive amounts of data um, that are part of the internet as a whole, right? And just because it's on the internet does not mean it's true, right, or accurate. Um, and so, you know, um, just making sure that you're aware of that bias and how that is implicated in legal um, in legal practice. And then uh, New York was talking about um, conflict of interest. This is interesting. They said that the use of the tools may not may potentially compromise your duty of loyalty under Rule 1.7, creating a conflict of interest. But there's no other talk about that within the whole entire opinion. So I don't know <laughs> where they're going with that. That was confusing, but we'll see if they um, give out more information. Yeah, interesting. You know, <laughs> perhaps they'll provide some clarity in the future. Yeah. Okay, so we can move on to the next thing. Clarity. Um, one of the things that we have to, as, as attorneys, we have to be up to date on court guidance and rules. You know, when you're going to submit a motion to a court, you need to follow the rules and it, whether it's a judge's specific rules or the court's rules. So a resource for um, everyone to use is Duke Center on Law and Tech um, has the Rails program, Responsible AI and Legal Services. They are keeping track of all of these court guidance and rules. So you can check out the, what guidance has been issued in your state and perhaps in your court. And there's a link to the Airtable there. And um, we'll talk about a LSNTAP resource as well. But right now, Duke Center's Rails program has the most up-to-date database for you to check. So I just wanted to make sure we had that. Now, this is the fun part. I think that's why everybody's came, right? To hear about all the sanctions. <laughs> you know, we're all in for a, a car, you know, car wreck. So I think we've all heard at this point about the Avianca case in New York where Stephen Schwartz, um, you know, cited several cases. Um, and I don't think at that point he was really in as much trouble as he got himself into later, because when the court came back to him and asked, hey, you know, where did you get this information? He, and are these cases correct? He went back to the chat GPT and asked chat GPT, hey, are these cases good? And chat GPT said, yes, of course they're good. And that's what he returned to the court saying, oh, yes, they're all they're all true cases. And that's when um, the court said, um, no, <laughs> and they fined him $5,000. So actually he was one, the very first that I heard of. And um, he actually got a pretty light um, sanction for that because others have lost their job that we're gonna talk about. Um, then there's the case of Scott, v. Federal National Mortgage Association. And in this case, an attorney, um, this was this case was in Maine, and this was a self-represented litigant. And you know, many people were up in arms about a self-represented litigant being sanctioned for use of AI. But honestly, in my opinion, the sanctions came only after the court had bent over backwards trying to assist this um, litigant, you know, with um, civil Rule Eleven civil procedure errors in getting motions filed properly. And you know, so after multiple times of the court being very lenient in their response to improperly filed documents or late documents, finally the, um, the court said, you know, we've had enough at this point and then did sanction, dismiss the case and sanction the litigant. Um, and one of the reasons was for the use of AI or blind reliance on AI and for violating those Rule 11 procedures. The N. Ray Newsom case was really interesting to me. It was a Florida attorney who was suspended for a year from, um, from federal court. So in this case, um, an opposing counsel, um, Newsom filed a motion, an opposing counsel wasn't able to find the cases. So the court asked Newsom to provide the cases in um, paper form and Newsom just um, was very evasive in his answers and then eventually was non-responsive. So um, the court suspended them from being able to practice. In Colorado, an attorney was, you know, was um, fired, um, was suspended from practice, 
but then the, his employer fired him for using generative AI and providing to the court hallucinated cases. So in that case, you know, he filed a motion without verifying that the cases were um, actual cases. And when the court offered an explain or offered or asked for an explanation, um, Newsom just didn't seem to provide a reasonable explanation or even seem to understand the seriousness of what he had done. And then the Moffitt versus Air Canada case, this was a case where Air Canada had maybe one of those overly friendly chatbots and a um, customer went to the website, um, they had a death in the family and they needed to purchase a bereavement fare so that they could go home. And the chatbot advised that they could make the purchase, you know, pay full price and then seek reimbursement from Air Canada after the fact for the difference between the regular fare and the bereavement fare. Um, you know, Air Canada argued that, you know, the chatbot was not, <laughs> was not their representative um, and that it did provide links to the real policy, but the court said, nope. And they held Air Canada responsible for what the chatbot had told the customer. So that's gonna be interesting to watch um, in the future as we see these cases come, you know, with these chatbots how it's going to affect, you know, the law and cases in the future. Anything you want to add in there, Ellen? No, it'll just be interesting. It's interesting how attorneys are continuing to do this. I mean, these are pretty high profile issues and they're just, they're doubling down. So, um, you know, you never know. <laughs> I guess attorneys do weird stuff all the time. We'll see. Absolutely. <laughs> so that's something that we, we must stress very much so that if you know these these systems are not um, meant for legal research we are starting to get some that are that do advertise hey we have all the cases you know available um, but I would take those claims of, of having access to all cases with a grain of salt um, there are many um, publicly available now chatbots, and I can think of a couple. I'm not going to say any um, out loud um, because I think as attorneys, we know that we should be using reliable sources for our searches, but just know where the data is sourced, know the limitations of the data. For example, you know, many of these um, even legal chatbots rely on um, Harvard's um, resources, which ended um, several years ago, you know, the access. So make sure that um, the source that you're using has up-to-date case information because that three or four year gap could be crucial to your case. You know, there could have been um, law that changed something from before or maybe strengthened and if the search engine that you, or the you know, generative AI that you're using doesn't have access to that data, your motion is going to be inaccurate and that's a problem. Um, mm -hmm. So Ellen mentioned earlier about the New York City chatbot and um, I found it really interesting that the mayor of New York City has chosen to leave that chatbot up and running, even though the guidance that it's providing would cause businesses to break the law, <laughs> you know, if they follow the guidance from this officially sanctioned chatbot. So don't be um, one of those businesses, you know, don't be an attorney who, who blindly follows the um, the guidance or the information provided by these chatbots because it may lead to sorrow in your future. So I'm going to, in just a minute, I will provide a link to um, a model or model, model guidelines that Ellis and Tap has developed that can be used in association with a technology policy. Um, 
for you know for your staff and your attorneys and your other employees to use because we do want to make sure that any of these AI usage, this is technology. So your technology policy is the number one place that you should start with whether or not you can use one of these tools um, to, to assist in your work. So start with your technology policy, make sure that you are following that policy. And then these um, guidelines may give you some assistance on, on suggesting ways of how you can use these tools without having to worry about um, you know, client confidentiality, because we're suggesting some things that will that you can use these tools for now in your work that will save you some time, let you dip your toe in without having to get into all of those um, you know, more complicated issues until you know your your firm has developed you know their usage or they have adopted a um, a tool for use by you know attorneys and um, employees of the firm um, I think we'll leave it at that I think the policy is kind of self-explanatory let's go on to if you want to get started with AI um, oh I need to give you that policy link so um, I'll, when, next time that Ellen is talking I'll add that link to the um, to the chat um, if you want to get started, there are some free resources. Microsoft's Copilot um, that you can access through the Edge browser is really good. I like it because it also does provide where it's pulled its answer from, so you can verify right there. Um, we also suggest starting small. You know, if you want to dip your toe in, use AI to create images for trainings or newsletters. And the great thing about that is you don't have to worry about whether those images are copyrighted. If you've generated them through a tool, they're available for your use. And in fact, images can't be copyrighted. AI generated images can't be copper copyrighted at this point anyway from case law. Um, use them to draft like a first email for a client or for a new hire. You know, try it out in, you know, they're pretty good at generating, you know, if you give the instructions of, you know, I need a client email to discuss, um, you know, our first appointment. And then if you put, you know, other little more information, if your prompt tells what kind of email you need, they're pretty good at um, generating them. You can also use them to check tone or readability of a document. If you want to make sure that if it's something that's going out for your clients, you can make sure that it's at the seventh grade readable level, or you can check the tone to make sure that you're not being snarky, which is a problem that I have. Um, you also or you're not, if you're really mad that your client did something terrible and you just like <laughs> let it all out and then it will rewrite it for you. So it's firm, but polite. <laughs> Absolutely. So another thing you can use them for is to summarize long documents or articles. They're really good at being able to pull out the main points and you know bullet points of something, especially if you don't have time to read it, but you want to know what's going on. Um, and then um, we have a resource on our website called AI in a Nutshell. And all of my links have disappeared. So give me a second um, and I will pull that. Oh, here it is. Uh, I'll drop that in the chat and I'm not forgetting that I still need to provide the guideline link. So that's just a place if you have missed, you know, some of our other AI related webinars, you can go there and see the ethics of AI part one. You can also go there to see the getting started with the AI presentation that I did that will actually show you and walk you through using some of these tools. And another tool that we've developed is our AI and law database. And this is a place that you can go to get summaries of the cases that have involved generative AI. We do also have many of the um, court guidelines, court guidance um, documents available there. We're also tracking international and um, national law, you know, at the, at the federal level, anything that would affect legal aid. 
Um, so there's lots of information there. And I do recommend, you know, when you go to that page, um, expand the Airtable so that you can see it better than how it is embedded into that web page. Um, I think anything else you want to add there, Ellen? I think you've seen all of those. No, it's a great web, it's a great uh, resource and um, really helpful. Oh, and they're also classified by state. So if there's been something in your state, you can very quickly sort and filter to find um, state-related cases. Um, any final thoughts, Ellen? I think it's a really exciting time. Um, I think these tools can be really used to make our work so much more efficient and really let us focus on the importance of connecting with our clients personally and you know taking that time that we would be doing other administrative tasks um, and really just making it more efficient. Uh, I don't think, honestly, I don't think anything has changed with the ethics of this type of technology. It's the same. We still have to be competent in its use. We still have to protect confidentiality, right? It's just the details that are a little different. But as long as we're aware of the issues that you know, could come up. I think it's, they're great tools to use, especially when you're starting with kind of those easier, lower hanging fruit tasks. What do you think, Shelley? I, I think they are. It's, it's fun to experiment um, and, you know, finding ways to use it so that you get a little bit of understanding about how it works and you can understand more when people say it hallucinates or, you know, it's, um, it's just a good good idea to try it so you understand its limitations. Um, and it's yeah. kind of fun. It is fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Clearly we think so. <laughs> I, I, I've dropped the link to our guidelines there in the chat and those are available for anyone to use to, to develop something that, that meets your agency's needs. Um, and now I'm going to switch the slide to some other resources, useful links, and we will be posting um, this webinar to YouTube and we'll also have the slides, your PDF of the slides so that they're available. So you have all of these, oops, <laughs> nice, big, I apparently forgot to insert a link there. <laughs> so, um, but the Ellison tab, AI in a nutshell is a great place to start, especially, you know, if your executive director is looking for guidance. I mean, that's how this was created. LSC reached out to me last week and said, hey, we're having a lot of executive directors <laughs> you know, want information. So we created this page to give some basic information. The database is always helpful. Oh, the model guidelines, I've just dropped that link in the chat and then a link to Duke um, Rails court guidance. So I have not had a, been able to track the chat. Are there any questions that we need to answer there? I didn't see any, but if anybody, I'm sure Shelly and I'd be happy to stay on if anybody had any questions. I don't see any. If anybody has questions now, here's our contact information if you have to run. But if you do have a moment you want to ask a question, you're welcome to do so. And seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the webinar. Thank you for attending. I really appreciate you stopping by. And if you're watching this in the recording later, feel free to reach out and we'll be able to answer your questions as well. Have a good Thank day. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you.